recording. So you agree with the recording? Yeah. Um, so yeah, welcome everybody. Today's speaker is uh, Karim Karim. He's received his PhD in electrical engineering from the University of Waterloo and an MBA in health sector management from the University of Toronto. Um, he is currently the Chief Technology Officer of KA Imaging, the Executive Director for the Center of Bioengineering and Biotechnology, and a Professor of Electrical and Computer Engineering at the University of Waterloo. Since 1998, Karim has developed novel X-ray Imaging Devices and Method, has supported multiple startups and founded multiple companies in the past two decades, including KA a imaging that is a University of Waterloo spin-off that is commercializing X-ray research from Cadmium, including Reveal, the world's only portable dual energy spectral X-ray detector that recently received a US FDA up clearance and is now being used clinically in North America to detect lung cancer and pneumonia, including COVID-19. Today, um, he will discuss Brilliant C, SE, development and application of the world's highest spatial resolution director conversion X-ray detector. So thank you very much, Karim, for being here and please go ahead. Thanks. Okay. Thank you, uh, Sylvia, for that uh, detailed introduction. Um, so as Sylvia, I think she's introduced me well. Uh, I'm, I'm both a professor at the University of Waterloo and uh, also a, a chief technology officer at a company that is commercializing the research that was done at the university over the last um, two decades. So the, so the particular detector I'll talk about today is the direct conversion detector that we've built. This was work actually that was carried out by a number of graduate students. The work actually started back in, um, I would say probably 2007. It was at the time a joint project with DALSA Semiconductor and um, over the years, um, different students and industry folks worked on it together. And in 2011, my um, former doctoral student, Dr. Chris Scott, he started and he kind of took it to its completion to what you see today. He's actually right now an imaging physicist at KA and still works on the next generation versions of this detector. So I'll talk about just a quick background on solid state X-ray detectors, phase contrast X-ray imaging, and the objectives of the research that was being carried out. Talk about the materials used to build the detector as well as the characterization steps. And then I'll talk a little bit about the results um, with regards to specifically spatial resolution, noise, quantum efficiency, and then um, some, some nice images that we've been able to take so far with um, regular X-ray and phase contrast imaging. I'll talk a little bit about different applications as well. So projection radiography, as you know, has been around for a very long time, um, but it really hasn't changed all that much. The images that you get with radiographs are, in a sense, similar to what you used to get before. They've improved somewhat in resolution, a little bit of better contrast on the bone, for sure. Um, and, and, but, but in terms of the general information that comes out of it, it's still roughly the same. Now. The way radiography is done, you have a number of different um, detectors. So the X-ray source generates the radiation and you need a receiver or a detector or an imager, if you will. And over the years, there have been varieties. People have started with film. They've used computed radiography, which is basically um, phosphor plates or scintillator plates. And then more recently is uh, digital radiography. So in the case of computed radiography or film, of course, it's indirect conversion because the X-ray had to go through a process by which it was converted to light photons before it was um, converted into electricity. Um, and so those are the storage forces I mentioned. In the, case of, in the case of digital radiography, you have a choice. You can use indirect conversion or you can use direct conversion. The indirect conversion is largely similar to what the computed radiography plates were doing. You, you need to use a scintillator then you need some kind of electronic readout mechanism that can read out an area array. So that could be thin film transistor arrays for large area imaging. You could use CCDs like uh, charge coupled devices for a smaller area, but higher resolution. You can use image intensifiers. You can use CMOS electronics. There's a whole variety of readout electronics out there. In the direct conversion space, that's 
a different means of uh, of capturing the x-ray in this particular case you use typically like a semiconductor detector and the x-ray is absorbed in the semiconductor and generates electricity directly so there's no intermediate um, optical photon creation step the advantage of course is spatial resolution um, so the so there are a couple of uh, devices that are in the field um, you've got your photoconductor flat panel detectors um, for example those that were used in um, or that are used rather in mammography where you use an amorphous selenium layer and you will stick it on top of a thin film transistor readout array or you can use materials like cadmium zinc telluride cadmium telluride even direct conversion silicon and in the old days you still had these selenium drums that were used for photocopiers which is um, where a lot of the motivation for this work came from so it should be pointed out for most of these existing solutions, the pixel size is typically in the 70 to 200 micron uh, range. Um, they're not usually a lot smaller for a variety of reasons. Um, for scintillators, you typically have spread in the scintillator that doesn't make it worthwhile to shrink the pixel because if you shrink the pixel, then you're forced to shrink the thickness of the scintillator. So you lose, um, so you lose uh, quantum efficiency. And in the direct conversion materials, really there hasn't been a direct conversion material um, that has been amenable to going to small pixel other than um, these evaporated materials like selenium. For all the other ones, you need to do some kind of a bump bonding process that ends up uh, making the pixel larger. Now, just a little bit of a background, you're all a physicist, so I imagine you already understand this, but I'll do it as a just as a quick review. Um, Phase contrast imaging has been around for a long time, um, used in the optical domain, um, and it's just about 30 years ago it started to make its way into the X-ray domain. The idea, of course, is that you're looking at the refraction of the electromagnetic wave in addition to just the attenuation. See, for X-ray, traditionally you've only done attenuation, but um, for but but recently. Um, there's been a greater recognition of the fact that when an X-ray passes through a low density material, um, it refracts and that refraction, that signal is significantly stronger than the attenuation signal in the same um, low density material. So what you end up getting, for example, is a very good contrast for low density materials if you consider the refracted signal as opposed to just the attenuation signal. And that contrast can be on the order of 10 to 1,000 times more than the attenuation signal. So it's quite attractive for that particular application. This is a nice diagram. You can kind of see you've got a, you've got a point source, in this case, of x-rays. And the x-rays, as they go through the object, there is a little bit of refraction, which allows which enables the creation of these interference patterns directly on the surface. The interesting part here is, of course, you have your interference pattern, so you can see these fringes, uh, so-called um, constructive and destructive interference. So you can always tell if you've got phase contrast in an image because you'll see these light and dark um, highlights around features of interest. There are some conditions on the coherence of the X-ray, um, but actually for most of the devices being used today, depending on I mean, I mean, obviously what you're doing, they can be met either using synchrotron facilities, but also um, microfocus sources that you can get um, off the shelf that could be used um, in a home lab. The, the key point though for propagation-based phase contrast, because it relies on refraction and the angle of refraction typically is very, very small, you need to put the detector really far away from the object. And when you do that, um, you, you see a drop off in signal. So the source needs to be really, really powerful in order to be able um, to work, for this to work. This is one of the reasons why propagation-based phase contrast is typically done at a synchrotron where you get a bright source. You don't see much of it happening um, in home labs or in benchtop or desktop type machines. Um, but the idea there is, of course, if you could have a detector, that had higher spatial resolution, then you could put the detector closer to the object and you wouldn't have to change your X-ray source. If the detector has high quantum efficiency, that's key because um, you can make use of all the photons coming from a weak source. 
So, so that's really the area that we went after. We said that, I mean, there are other ways to do, um, there's other ways to do face contrast imaging. You can use refractive gratings and, and diffraction gratings and whatnot. You can use an interferometer, like the same way you would do um, any other kind of, uh, um, in, it, it, like the same way you would create any other kind of interference pattern. But the part that was interesting for us was propagation based for a number of reasons. One, of course, there's no gratings and X-rays don't like gratings, especially the higher energy ones. They work well at the low energies, but not at like 40 or 60 kb. You, the gradient becomes transmissive. Um, the other piece, of course, is it's a simple system. Um, you can do this, I, I mean, literally with like a minimal um, effort in setup. You yeah. don't have to worry about vibration in the systems because um, the detector and the source, I mean, it's, a, it's, it's like a simple X-ray cabinet. So, so that's the area we went down. And we said, let's take a look at um, the various types of X-ray detectors out there and the ones that we wanted to focus on. So the indirect conversion, I think I mentioned earlier, you had your scintillator and then you had a photodiode and the substrate. The X-ray strikes the scintillator, generates the optical photons. They tend to scatter usually. Even if you have a structured scintillator, you still get a bit of scatter, typically at the interfaces, um, because that's just how the scintillator is grown. That scatter, of course, gives rise to um, a, a blurry signal and a poor um, modulation transfer function. The, the photodiodes basically take the light and convert it into electricity, and then you've got your substrate. Now, in the direct conversion material, it's similar. The only difference being you don't need a scintillator. You try and absorb the X-ray in the photoconductor directly. So what you do there is in order to get good collection, you have to put a large voltage across the semiconductor to create that pull to get the drift. Um, and so you get your electron hole pairs separating, and that's how you basically get your signal. The photoconductor typically has to have some kind of minimal thickness so that it can absorb all the incident x-rays. If, if you pick a very thin photoconductor, of course, nothing will absorb and you've given up efficiency. So you do need something that has a reasonable atomic number, typically in the range of at least 20, 30, 40, um, um, selenium is, I think, sitting in the 30s, so it's a decent, It's, I think it's 34, so it's a decent semiconductor for that. Of course, we'd like to have it at 50 or 100 or 80 or whatnot, but um, some of those materials have toxicity, so it's not as easy to just jump onto them. So selenium still, because it's not toxic, it's uh, been around for a long time. That's one of the reasons why we used it. Actually, I mean, the real reason we used it is because I got into working with this material during my grad work um, 25 years ago, and um, it proved to be so versatile that I never really left it. It was it was a great material. Um, Xerox actually developed it initially. They got all the early patents back in the 1970s, and uh, they started making their photocopiers. That's the that's the business Xerox made all its money on. Um, they made photocopiers with selenium back in the day of course there was no electronic readout they were using electron um, readout to actually get the signal out and vacuum and whatnot but um, the the reason why it worked for photocopiers is the same reason why it works for x-ray it's easily processed as a uniform thick layer over a large area it's got a good atomic number it's got low dark currents and high charge collection efficiencies and i mean specifically for x-ray um, even for a for an X-ray photon between 20 and 40 kV, the spread um, due to photoelectric interaction and any kind of fluorescence can be confined to a less than six micron area. So it actually maintains its spatial resolution. Um, and that's what's attractive about this for X-ray imaging. The other piece, of course, is you've got high inherent spatial resolution, high absorption for diagnostic energy X-rays, but then you can pair this type of material with high resolution CMOS um, readout arrays. And those are low noise to start with. So it's a very good match in terms of being able to pick up um, single photons even. Just uh, for those of you who might be interested, the X-ray attenuation coefficients for selenium between 10 and 100 kV, you can see kind of that um, photoelectric, which is this green line right here. That's what kind of dominates. You've got a little bit of Raleigh and a little bit of uh, Compton. But uh, but really, it's it's all driven by um, photoelectric. This actually works for higher energies too. Just you lose absorption; just doesn't absorb as well. 
And this uh, curve just kind of gives the other side of it, the X-ray interaction, energy deposition in selenium. So again, photoelectric is responsible for about 86% at 35 keV. You still get a little bit of K alpha and K beta, but it's mostly photoelectric. So the way we usually evaluate detectors, we use something, uh, a metric, a well-known metric. It's used for the optical guys as well, but X-ray has really taken it to heart. It's the modulation transfer function. It's really nothing more than looking at contrast as a function of spatial frequency. So the best way to think about it is, is that if your input signal is a sinusoid, you have a detector system that modifies it with some kind of a transfer function, and then you get an output sinusoid. How close of a replica the output is to the input is what determines the MTF. And you can do this at different frequencies. And here we say spatial frequency because this just refers to the spatial frequency associated with the objects. Sharper objects obviously have much higher spatial frequencies associated with them. So you want to see how well that signal carries through. So the MTF is usually plotted on a graph that goes um, MTF for spatial frequency and an MTF of one means the output signal um, mirrors the input signal perfectly. Um, higher spatial frequencies, you can see how the signal is degrading. So that's why you see the MTF curve typically drop off at high spatial frequencies. The other metric that's used to look at detectors is noise power spectrum. It's stated it's the spectral decomposition of the noise variance, um, comes from a variety of different factors, non-idealities, um, X-ray capture cross-sections, as well as electronic noise in the, in the, in the detector itself. Um, and when you take the two of them together, you can actually realize the actual metric that most detector makers will quote is the detective quantum efficiency. The idea behind detective quantum efficiency is that you've got your signal coming in and you are taking into account all the different processes that are affecting the MTF first. So for example, you've got your photoelectric effect, your K fluorescence and whatnot. And at the end, you basically add in um, the noise. In this case, for example, if you've got any kind of noise aliasing in there, if you've got uh, uh, um, any kind of additional readout noise that is not naturally due to the um, electronics that you're using, they're never noiseless. And then you basically get your DQE. And intuitively, it's a nice metric. It's basically just looking at the signal to noise ratio square out that's coming out, like divided by what went in. So it's a, it's a good metric and it's a function of spatial frequency. So you can get a DQE curve across spatial frequency and you get an idea of how well the detector functions. This is a modulation transfer function for selenium, just to give you an idea. Um, you can see, for example, the, the solid black line is the one that represents the actual performance. Um, the, the dotted line is the MTF, the theoretical best MTF given by the aperture of the pixel or the pixel pitch. So whatever your pixel pitch is, basically what's going to ultimately govern what's the best MTF you're going to get. And the, and the X-rays and the X-ray semiconductor can only make that worse. So sure enough, you've got your photoelectron range, but you've also got the K fluorescence reabsorption. Both of these are affecting the MTF, which is why the solid black line falls below the dashed black line. So the goal that we try to achieve here is to build basically amorphous selenium material and integrate it with CMOS readout pixel arrays to get this unique combination of high spatial resolution and also high quantum efficiency for hard X-rays. The goal was, of course, we were going after phase contrast X-ray imaging. On this figure, you can see there's a amorphous selenium that kind of shows up in on the left there, and you can see the selenium film, the grayish color. It's a glass, uh, um, a calcogenide, uh, and that's the ITO substrate before it was deposited. On the right side, you can on the right side you can actually see the CMOS pixel array. It's a three transistor active pixel, and then the selenium basically had to be deposited on this. So we actually would take these substrates and coat them with selenium, and then do the wire bonding and packaging after. So let's get a little bit into how these devices are built. So selenium is built um, by thermal evaporation. So you basically take a thermal evaporator, you've got this big boat with a shutter on top of it. You've got your substrate that sits up top on a, on a platen that is rotating to ensure uniformity. And you've got a substrate shutter to make sure um, early selenium doesn't get deposited on it. You've got a quartz crystal that's actually measuring the rate of deposition. 
um, and, and then the area of the deposition. So you take the silicon dye that you've got, we made some shadow masks, stuck the dye in the shadow mask. And, uh, and, and this was all done at the University of Waterloo. There's actually a clean room there called the G2N, Giga2 Nano. And, uh, and we do the depositions in the clean room. And, and on the CMOS itself, um, what we have is you've got the pixel array that sits here. You've got a bunch of metallization that's used as interconnect for the pixel array. And then right at the top, we open up vias in the scratch protection layer. So typically CMOS wafers have a scratch protection layer put on top of them to make sure that um, um, nothing accidentally gets onto the semiconductor surface. But in our case, we want selenium to contact that scratch protection, the, the, the surface. So we had to open up openings. So that's a custom process. And then we deposit selenium through that and then put some kind of a top contact, gold, chrome, aluminum, there's lots of choices. And basically that's how you create your um, structure. Uh, one thing I should mention with selenium, one of the challenges of working with amorphous selenium is that this material prefers actually to be in a polycrystalline state. And it's actually difficult to keep it as a purely amorphous material. You want to keep it as an amorphous material because you don't want leakage currents um, because the polycrystalline state of this material has a higher leakage current. But when you're talking about imaging, you'd want to minimize the leakage current. So you prefer the material to remain amorphous. The problem is though, um, it's, it's a glass as I mentioned, any kind of mechanical strain on any one of the surfaces can trigger the process of crystallization. So what you need to do is actually reduce the likelihood of that crystallization happening so the material actually survives. Now in industry, people use heavily arsenic doped layers of selenium to prevent crystallization from happening. What we did is we actually tried something unique when we were building this. We actually used a soft polymer. In our case, we used a layer of polyamide. Um, it's a commercially available material used in um, CMOS processing, actually, which is the reason why we used it. We spin coat it onto the substrate, we bake it, and then uh, you, you, you deposit the selenium on top of it. And the neat thing with the polyamide is because it's a soft layer, it uh, allows the selenium, if you will, the ability to um, do its mechanical motion without crystallizing. And interestingly enough, when we put in this uh, polyamide, we found it turned out to be more stable than the traditional arsenic doped selenium. So here, for example, we had polyamide, we had amorphous selenium, and then we had a, 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 a ohmic contact on the top, this PTCBI layer. And uh, we were able to basically measure um, the signals that we were getting, as well as we were able to see how this device functioned. To, anyway, that was more of a practical um, tangent. To, to get back to the detector, we wanted to measure the MTF. So of course we had to get ourselves a very nice edge. So we had to machine one of these edges and we used the slanted edge technique where you basically place the edge across a whole bunch of little pixels. And then you try and get the edge spread function from that. Um, not, not, not too difficult to do. All right, so let's talk a little bit about the results. So this was actually the one of the early prototypes. It's the first prototype that worked properly. Let me put it that way. The earliest prototypes we built were back in 2007, 2008, but they all had a hard time working for a variety of reasons. Either the selenium was crystallized or the devices were too small to really put um, selenium on top of them or the electronics failed because the circuit design wasn't done correctly. There was always some reason, but this was the first one that actually worked. It was done in 2010, 2011 in that time frame. And it was a 3T active pixel sensor with 25 micron pixels, a 640 by 640 pixel array with a 1.6 by 1.6 centimeter square imaging area. And we deposited the selenium on top of it. This was work actually that was done with Dalsa Semiconductor. It's also a company based in Waterloo. They helped with the electronic design and we did all the selenium integration. So here's a cross section, an SEM of that same wafer. You can see the CMOS substrate along with its top contacts. You can see the unetched passivation layers and the aluminum pixel pad, and then of course the selenium that goes on top. 
here's a better look at the cross section. So we had the CMOS wafer, selenium, we used gold because it was easy. Put in an insulating epoxy to do a little bit of isolation for the for the um, signal pads, and then a silver epoxy basically to supply the high voltage, which is something you're seeing right here. There's the high voltage. So that's the actual wafer die bonded properly. You can see the CMOS die, that's the outline of the CMOS die. The selenium is sitting on top of it, and the gold is sitting yet on top of that. And then you've got the uh, high voltage connections as well as a bunch of potting materials to make sure that uh, the bond pads don't get damaged. And when we did the first measurements on PETA, what was a pleasant surprise was the model actually was pretty close to what we measured experimentally. The MTF actually was in reasonably good agreement with, uh, with the model. And this model is primarily governed by the aperture. So we're talking 25 micron pixels. So that's what we saw here. And at the time when we reported this was in 2011, it was one of the highest spatial resolution direct conversion X-ray detectors. We did a few uh, images with it. Um, for example, this uh, aortic uh, stent, it's just basically a metal wire in the 25 to 50 micron range, but it was visible very clearly. It was a great image. It's typically used in uh, aortic aneurysms. And anyway, so that was, that was the first design, but then shortly after that, we started the second design and we said, we've done it at 25 microns. Let's start going to something even smaller. So we went after 10 microns and below. And there we used, again, the same 3T active pixel sensor design. The pixel pitch we built was like five and a half by six and a quarter microns. It was a very small array, a 32 by 32. So I mentioned that the previous design we did in, with help from Dalsa Semiconductor and they had done the electronics. This design was actually entirely done within the university. We I worked with a professor, uh, Professor Peter Levine. He's one of my colleagues at the university and he's very good at the CMOS pixel arrays. So, and he had built a few of these before when he used to work in the Bay Area. So he helped make sure that the pixel array would work well. We got the selenium process working from before and we put it together, tiny little device, very small imaging area, but, um, but the same overall idea. You still got the selenium film, you've got the gold on top and you put in the high voltage and, and off you go. And the chip is wire bonded so you can do the readout from it. And this was, Pretty good, but we actually had a bit of a surprise. So what we used was an old portable X-ray source that we had sitting around. We stuck the detector in the cabinet. We found a way to get high voltage to it. We had um, you know, the power supply unit for the detector and a power supply unit for the actual high voltage sensor. And what we used in this particular case, okay. So the predicted value was the orange curve. What we actually ended up measuring were the blue and the yellow curves. And they were pretty far away from the predicted value. And this was the first recognition for us that um, the spot size, the focal spot size is a limiting factor because in the lab, we didn't have a micro focus source at the time. We had these portable X-ray sources with one millimeter focal spots. So they actually ended up um, really affecting the performance of the detector. When we accounted for the focal spot blur, then the measured and the predicted value were very close to each other. So we knew at that point we had something and we said we need to go about finding microfocus sources. So I had put in for an RTI grant through NSERC. And then the next year we actually got it. Anyway, for that early detector, we measured the noise power spectrum. It wasn't too far off what we thought. And then we also measured DQE. Again, it wasn't too, off, too far off what we thought because it was primarily the focal spot blur. But it's still instructive to notice that at 40 line pairs per millimeter, we were still getting more than 5%, 6% DQE. So this was really good, um, even for that time. And this was work done in around 2013, 2014 in that, in, that, in that time frame. So we were happy with the results we got. Then later on, uh, through the RTI grant process, we managed to get ourselves a little microfocus source. This is a Thermo Fisher Kevex. It's a five micron focal spot. Um, four watts of power, very, very low power. Um, but it doesn't really matter because in the lab, we were, we were okay to work with something like this. We made a small collimator, stuck the detector in, put the sample on the linear stage. And one of the first samples we imaged was actually these lucite, um, lucite. 
And what we noticed right away was this banding, this bright band and the dark band right at the edge of the air and the PMMA. And that, of course, was what told us that we were seeing phase contrast. Because at the time when we were building this, we knew we could, we, we had a shot at doing phase contrast, but we really didn't think we'd be able to see anything. But even with that 32 pixel by 32 pixel detector, we picked up phase contrast at the boundary. And it was decent enough. It was the signal was strong enough for us to see it. So we were happy. So what you're seeing here is when the distance between the object and the detector is two centimeters. And in this case, the orange case, the distance between the object and the detector is eight centimeters. Obviously, the eight centimeter signal is much stronger because you expect there to be more phase contrast because there's eight centimeters for refraction. For the two centimeter signal, the phase contrast is less because you don't have as much distance, but you still see something. It's not like you don't see anything. So that was very uh, uh, encouraging. And we continued um, building new arrays. Now, around that time, um, we transferred a lot of this technology into the company KA Imaging that I had founded. And so the company then started to carry the torch. And the company actually built a 3T active pixel sensor with many of the same players who were at the university, I should add. And it was an 8 micron pixel, roughly, but it was a 1K by 1K array. So the area of imaging was bigger than, um, you know, like a millimeter. It was 8 millimeters by 8 millimeters. And this is what the IC looked like. You can see how the quality of the IC changes and the, <laughs> the detector changes over time. As we learned, we made devices a little better. Um, so in this case, you have your CMOS array. You've put the selenium on top and you stuck the gold on. And then you've got your high voltage connection, which we made here. This looks a lot cleaner than the previous ones. And this was probably one of the best results that we got. So we used the same Thermo Fisher Kevex source. We had a rotational stage in this case, and you've got the detector with the selenium sitting right there. You can see it. The stages can be moved around to adjust for um, the source object to test, uh, distance and the object detector distance. And here are just some. Um, SENs showing the edge that was used to measure MTF. So the edge wasn't bad. It was half decent. I think we could have probably made it sharper, but it wasn't too bad. And then we did some uh, measurements of what the spatial resolution would be, the MTFs, different uh, for, for different energies, for 35, 40, 80, and 120. You can see, how obviously, the 120 kV MTF is lower because you're going to have a lot more contribution from the non-photoelectric variety. Of, uh, of cross section, but nonetheless, um, still interesting MTFs. Um, when we actually did the measurement, <clears throat> we actually saw what we were hoping to see. So what you see in this graph is the MTF due to pixel aperture, basically the theoretical best that we could achieve, and that's the dashed line. And then you see the solid black line, which is what we predict having taken into account, for example, the various um, MTF degrading mechanisms within selenium, like uh, the K fluorescence, um, as well as, for example, focal solid blurring and whatnot. And then what you see with the blue is what we actually measured. So there was, I would say, pretty good agreement. We're still trying to figure out what the gap was. Maybe it was obliquity or something. But, um, but it was pretty close to what we thought it was going to be. And what's nice here is that um, at 50% at, uh, contrast, you're still sitting at uh, close to 50 line pairs per millimeter. It's a 50% contrast for 11 micron object. Just to put this in uh, context, some of the other scintillator-based approaches, they use 15 micron Gadox scintillators with a nine micron pixel. They were able to get a full width half max at around 9.7 microns. Um, that 9.7 microns was what we got. They got it at 27 microns. So this direct conversion material was still three times better in spatial resolution, even when compared to a really thin Gadox scintillator. And mind you, this our device has a lot more um, quantum efficiency compared to the Gadox. But still, even on the MTF side, we were able to do better than the Gadox because the Gadox had uh, scatter, optical scatter, um, in the in the in the scintillator. When we look at the um, okay, so so 
And so to do this properly, we ended up having to do some characterization on the microfocal source. I'm just going to be cautious on the time because I was told not to take too long. Um, I'm going to skip this part on how we characterize the microfocus, but we basically calibrated all our stuff, our spectrometers and whatnot, so that when we did the measurements for noise and quantum efficiency, we have actually very good confidence in it. So the noise power spectrum was um, very close to what we expected. And the DQE was also not too far away. So this, these are the measured data points for DQE for a variety of different levels of uh, um, X-ray exposure, all the way from 9 MR to 24 MR. And then um, the black line is what the ideal situation is. And then obviously, this is what we measured. What's interesting here is even at 60 line pairs per millimeter, you're looking at a DQE of about 12 to 13%. So that's the highest DQE at that spatial frequency that we've seen reported, even to this day. This was work that was done about four years ago, but it's uh, it's still one of the highest. The closest we saw was stuff like this 15 micron Gadox scintillator. They had a quantum efficiency of 13%, but that was at zero spatial frequency. They had basically zero quantum efficiency at 60 line pairs per millimeter. They didn't even come close. So this was the camera that was built using that detector, the one megapixel detector. We've now built a slightly bigger camera. It's a 16 megapixel detector, a 4K by 4K, same type of design, eight micron pixels. And we've taken those detectors and made a little benchtop micro CT out of it. So you can do in situ um, imaging of, uh, of, 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 and actually non-destructive imaging of a variety of objects. So, so the, so the system is very simple. You've got a microfocus source with like a five micron or a two micron spot. You've got a rotation stage where you can put your sample and then you've got the uh, detector, the CMOS selenium detector, the 4K by 4K. And the beauty of this is you're getting um, efficiency at 60 line pairs, which you would never get with a conventional scintillator detector. And, um, and we were able to get some really nice face contrast images that I'm going to share in a bit. And the true spatial resolution is only limited by the focal spot of the X-ray source. So if you wanted to go to even nanometer-sized imaging, all you have to do is get yourself a nanometer-sized microfocus source. And there's a few of those available. Um, you'd have to create your own system, of course, but it's, it's entirely doable because of the detector. So what are the applications we've looked at? We've looked at semiconductors. We've looked at material science, electronics inspection. Um, some people have even asked us to image uh, things you would find, like artifacts from a museum, um, like old paper and stuff like that. Small animals, like mice, you'll see some of that. Seeds in agriculture. We've looked at some construction materials, like the lightweight aggregates. 3D printed materials, including Kevlar um, and, and, other and other polymer composites that are used for, um, that are used um, commonly in aerospace and even in automotive construction. Um, glass fibers, and of course, dental implants, including porcelain. So here's a nice um, image. It's one of the early images we took. It's a, it's a pure phase object, so we love to see the little interference pattern at both the edges. That tells us that the device is actually providing us phase contrast imaging. It's an optic fiber. Uh, this one's perhaps more interesting. This is a, a green pepper seed, so like the bell pepper. and um, we minimize the phase contrast by decreasing the object detector distance to one centimeter. And this is the image you get. You increase the object detector distance to eight centimeters and the phase contrast just pops right out. You can see the cell walls, you can see the rings inside the seed. You can even see the fibers that may be hanging off. It's like the, the visualization is quite nice. Here's another seed, same story. This one was acquired in less than a second. You can see the cellular structure quite nicely. Um, lots of little detail that pops up. This is an image taken of a mouse paw. In this case, the, the object detector distance was 18 centimeters and the exposure time was nine seconds. But it's very nice. You can see the trabecular structure in the bone. You can see, for example, all sorts of soft tissue. You can even see the hair on the mouse, which is very interesting. And this was a bay leaf, a dried bay leaf, a, a good cooking. Uh, um, spice and you can see of course the leaf in gory detail and we could have zoomed in on this and maybe even highlighted some of the stuff if there was interest there's the stem right in the middle 
this was one of the ones that uh, got a little bit of attention from um, some people in the uh, life sciences space. So they often do small animal imaging. In this particular case, we looked at the knee joint of a mouse and we were able to pick up the articular cartilage right here. So that articular cartilage is soft tissue. You would typically not be able to see it because um, X-ray doesn't have the contrast. MR would have a hard time picking that up because they don't have the 50 micron type resolution. And so the fact that we picked it up highlighted a nice application area in a place where both X-ray and MR could not uh, uh, operate, but face contrast X-ray does work there. This is another image of the same knee, a different angle. You can see the articular cartilage again, right there. Um, and I, I, you can see a lot of soft tissue as well. It's zoomed in here, so you can see it a bit more clearly. This was a 3D reconstruction that we made of that same knee. So you can kind of see, or I don't know if it was the same knee or another knee, but uh, it's a nice, so we took projections around the mouse's knee. So we were able to do this reconstruction. And then of course, if you do reconstruction, you can do all sorts of interesting things. Like in this case, we were able to um, do cross sections and slices. So you could see, for example, the bone structure in great detail, along with what's happening here with the cartilage right there at the interface. So it's a neat, it's, it's neat. It's actually one of the first face contrast CT images out there. You don't see much of you, like you don't see many of these. And these are the slices, same, same, uh, same, same knee, but now you can see the slices in a little bit more detail. So you can see again, the face contrast acting up right at the interface there. Trabecular bone structure, of course, nice detail. And I mean, the neat thing here is each of these images, like when we take a single image, it's typically less than a second. When we acquire all the images for a CT, you're looking at maybe a thousand seconds. So, you know, maybe an hour and a half in that range or, or like an hour in that range. This one is a titanium bone implant. In this case, the titanium bone was, uh, the, the titanium implant was put inside a bone. Sometimes people like to see how the bone grows in and around the implant. So again, when we minimize the face contrast, of course, the detail is not so clear, but with the face contrast, you can see all sorts of detail in and around the bone. And they're typically looking at these interfaces very carefully. We've also looked at uh, um, implants for the ear as well, um, essentially in applications for, uh, for the deaf. Here's a nice image of a, of a, of a polymer composite. So this is a Kevlar, 3D reconstructed. These are the projections that you can see in the background. You can see the patterning of the, of the Kevlar as well as individual fibers. And then of course you can see the full 3D. You can obviously get slices of this as well, if there was interest. This is a lightweight aggregate material uh, used in construction, usually roads, lots and lots of pores. They like to quantify the pore density without having to take the material apart. This is just a single projection. That's the 3D rendering, but if you wanted, you could also see the slices and you can see the pores and you can quantify if there's any defects or if any pores are irregularly shaped and whatnot. So neat, uh, neat, uh, neat, neat opportunities. Aluminum, of course, is no problem. You don't really need face contrast for this type of image. This was one of our earlier images, but you can see voids inside metal structures quite nicely. Um, electronics, these were LEDs for wire bonding. If you wanted to see, you can actually see the layers inside the LED as well as the epoxy that kind of seals the LED in. Some more LEDs, mini LEDs used in uh, display technology. Again, you can see the, bond the bonds and stuff in great detail. 3D reconstruction of that same LED. This is an interesting one. This is actually a 3D integrated circuit. So you've got two ICs that are stacked on top of each other using a uh, copper basically at the bond point so sometimes you want to see if the bond point is okay or if there's irregularity or whatnot so of course with an optical image you can't really see anything so the only option here is x-ray because this is for example the top of that chip this is the bottom of that chip you're not going to see much but at the interface of the chip in between the two chips you should be able to see this pattern and and that's exactly what you see you can see the pattern and you can see the wire, the routing, and you can see all sorts of things. And you can do 3D cross sections of this as well. Different projections at different angles. 
some more wire bonding shots that we took of, of various ICs. This is another interesting one. In this case, you've got a integrated circuit on a flexible substrate. You want to see if, um, if the imaging actually picks up, you know, like from a reliability perspective, are the leads lining up properly? So you can see that with X-ray nicely. X-ray shows you this part that's not visible in the optical image, right? So that's, an, that's another neat application in the industrial imaging side. But anyway, to summarize, phase contrast X-ray and CT offer high contrast um, imaging of biological low density and low Z materials with a low radiation dose, lower radiation dose than conventional X-ray and CT. And the brilliance detector, the CMOS selenium detector is what enables this phase contrast imaging in a benchtop. And it's also been applied to a variety of tasks. There's lots of applications and would love to see if you've got any unique uses. So I'll stop here. I think I'm done. Yeah. Okay. So thank you very much for the very nice talk. Um, there are some time, so people won't have any question. If not, maybe you can come back to the calibration of uh, that you skip because I was interested in that, but um, let's see if there are some questions. Okay. I don't see any hands up. So. Yeah, this was one of the flies we had imaged, oh. big, a big house fly. This was one of our first images. We were so impressed because you can actually see the feeding tube of the fly. You can see the eye uh, or the compound eye. You can see the hair on the back of the fly <laughs> and growing from the side and on the legs. It was really a, a nice image. Um, there's lots of publications on it. I can refer these um, to, to anybody. Thank you very much. Look, it was looking like a um, pencil drawing. Yes, I know. I know. Isn't that interesting? Yeah, that's what's very thought. nice. We were just shocked at the quality you could get, actually. Uh, Fabrice? Yeah, sorry. Hi, I'm Fabrice Rott here from Triumph. I got disconnected at some point, so I may have missed uh, uh, some part of the discussion. So I was wondering, uh, maybe closer to our application, where we are trying to see uh, single photons. Uh, here, you, you are using an integrator, I assume, like your electronics, uh, these this pixels integrate. They so, are, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's it's yeah. it's primarily integration mode imaging. So, what's the prospect? I know that some people are looking at having gain or doing impact ionization. What's uh, the application, Fabrice? What are you trying to do? Well, uh, UV photons, they are vacuum UV photons. Okay. Uh, so, in the ten EV, ten EV range is a mm. is of interest to us uh, in liquid argon, for yeah. example. That will be very difficult with this camera. It's uh, it's designed for X-ray, so you could use it for UV if you took off the epoxy, and but I don't know if you will pick up a single photon because the noise on the camera because it's designed for high dynamic range. We actually built, you know, a lot of this design was actually informed by Argonne National Labs because they do a lot of Bragg CDI type experiments there. So this camera, the original prototypes, the specification we used was actually Bragg CDI. Um, so, so therefore it has a very big dynamic range. Like uh, like we use it on, on the beam at the synchrotron and the camera never gets saturated because the, the, the full well capacity is large. But in order to do that, the electronic noise was sacrificed. So the yeah. electronic noise on this type of camera, the best is maybe around a hundred electrons which uh, from an x-ray perspective can give you single photon imaging but from a yeah. uv perspective will not do it so for so, x-ray yeah, yeah. so that, that's a, that's a new development are there new development at least on your end at waterloo are there new so new type of device and new type are you yeah. working on that i guess yeah we've been always focused on x-ray so i have to be very frank yeah like there was a time when we did uv but we never really explored it in any depth uh, so selenium but by the way i mean about six years back i had a student and she did a lot of work on the uv and showed how selenium has some advantages for uv and we were able to go down to even 200 nanometers um wavelength okay. uv right uh, but the but the but the but the challenge was the electronics we never developed them to be single photon 
Um, but if we could, uh, if we develop the single photon electronics, then yeah, no problem. Selenium would do a great job for UV. And maybe uh, after, if you send me your email, I'll send you some of the publications we put on UV. I mean, it's something that yeah. we could start, but it's not something we're actively working on right now. Yeah, actually, I have seen some. There's actually a chip from CERN called TimePix that uh, yes. may be, may be yeah. good. Yeah, yeah. No, I've seen the time picks, but the pixel pitch is large. I guess you don't care about the pixel pitch? Depends. In general, no, but... Yeah, okay. Yeah, yeah. Because yeah. the time picks, I think they go at like 55 or something like that, if I remember yeah. correctly. 55 micron. So. Okay. Thank you, yeah. Um, so I see another question from Serge. Hello, Karim. Thank you for your interesting talk. And uh, I have a question. Since you are working with the Selenium, probably you... Uh, start to consider also to uh, like a change or like a sweep application to some fundamental physics, for example, uh, for double beta decay on selenium 82 or like enriched isotope. Are you planning to do something like that, for example, because in that case you can do uh, very good uh, special resolution so you can reduce the ground at the same time you can be sensitive to the x rays that no one do in yes. the field. So, yeah. I to do so. Yeah, I'm very interested in the double beta decay experiments, actually. In fact, uh, this device could be used for that. But as you know, for us, we're detector makers. So we rely on the physicists to uh, to work. To, we, we rely on working with physicists to actually run those experiments. So, I mean, if there's an interest in using one of these devices for double beta decay, by all means, let's, uh, let's have that conversation. Okay. And uh, what kind of purity of raw material you need in order to make this deposition? Uh, like so... Big? So the selenium we're using is typically five nines. So it's 99.999%. But uh, mind you, we do dope it with impurities. So we've got a little bit of arsenic, we've got a little chlorine in there. So a little bit of doping doesn't change much. The thing is, you just want to make sure the transport properties of the selenium don't get affected okay. uh, for the holes and the electrons. But uh, if, if you've got some ideas around uh, what you want to dope it with, we could do some quick calculations and I could tell you if uh, th this will cause a serious problem in imaging or not. Right, because in principle, I have, we have some, some batch of enriched selenium and in principle, it could be interesting to start implementing yeah. this kind of uh, alternative yeah. device. Yeah, is it pure selenium you've got? I actually, uh, we got it purified, but there are some uh, impurities inside, so I can send you like an ICPMS measurement of that, so yeah. you can see if it's yeah. a, like a chewable. Um, yeah, chewable yeah. yeah, I can also send you the spec sheet on the selenium we use, and, uh, um, and, and let me know what you think of that as well. Because uh, we use a certain supplier, because uh, as I mentioned with selenium, the, the biggest concern is crystallization. And so, we typically employ a little bit of arsenic in the selenium to make sure the device has a half decent lifetime. Otherwise, the device will not last more than a few months. Um, but if you put a little arsenic in it, like 0.5% arsenic, the device will last at least three or four years, maybe five years. So that's kind of the reason why we use that. But uh, yeah, it'd be interesting to have that conversation and see if there's a way um, even the selenium that you have, maybe we can get an alloy with a little bit of uh, arsenic in it and maybe it won't affect your measurements too much. Okay, yeah, let's contact later by email. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Are there any other questions or comments? If uh, not, I would like to thank Karim again for the very nice talk. Thank you again. Thank you so, for, yeah. no, no, it's my pleasure. Thank you for inviting me. Yeah, no, we look forward to doing something uh, on the physics side. I said we've got lots of interesting detectors. If you are interested, have a look at the KE Imaging website. We've also got a large area spectral detector. That, oh, uh, okay. That's... Yeah, in fact, uh, I was going to say that uh, Stefan Kaisia from Guelph just tested it at the light source recently. So we are just awaiting. Um, what kind of results have come out of that spectral detector? We'll see how that goes. But there's some, yeah, there's some very unique detectors. Okay. Good. Thank you very much. All Thanks. right. Thanks, have folks. A have day. a good afternoon. Take care. Bye-bye. You too. Bye. Bye. Yes.